Hello my dear bachcho and welcome back. Your exams are just around the corner and I know, I know the tension is building, isn't it? But please don't you worry at all. I am here to make this chapter how nature works in harmony so simple and so easy that every single concept is going to stick in your mind like a magnet. So come on, chalo, let's make this the easiest chapter in your whole textbook. Okay, so let's start with a little mystery. Look at this picture here. We see these beautiful, majestic elephants. But hold on, why are they so close to a railway line, so near our villages? We see this kind of thing on the news all the time, no? Elephants wandering into farms. It's a puzzle, and you and I, we're going to solve it together. What do you think is happening here? So, to solve our little elephant mystery, this first section is all about figuring out why these gentle giants might have left their homes in the first place. Come on, let's put on our detective hats and find the clues together. And here are the clues. Just think about your own home for a second. You need food, you need water, and you need space to live comfortably, right? Well, it's exactly the same for these elephants. But their homes, the forests, are shrinking. We call this deforestation. The water sources are drying up, and there's just not enough food for them. So what are they going to do? They wander into nearby farms smelling all that tasty food like sugarcane. You see, it's not that they want to bother us. They're simply trying to survive. So this whole idea of a home is actually super, super important. To really understand any home in nature, whether it's for a giant elephant or a tiny little ant, we first need to get what it's made of and who lives there. It's kind of like understanding the players and the playing field before you start a game. And you know, there's a special word for an animal's home. It's habitat. The easiest way to think of it is like this. A habitat is the permanent address or the pin code for any plant or animal in the big, big city of nature. It's the one place that gives it everything it needs to live. Just look at this. On the left, we've got a pond habitat, and on the right, a forest habitat. Both are homes, but they look so different, no? They have totally different residents and different facilities. I mean, a fish can't live in a forest, and a deer can't live underwater. Every habitat is unique and special in its own way. So, in every single habitat, there are two teams that have to work together perfectly. First, you have the biotic team. Remember, bio means life, so this team includes all the living things. Plants, animals, insects, fungi, you name it. Then you have the abiotic team. The A means not, so these are all the non-living but super important things, like sunlight, water, soil, and even the temperature. For any habitat to work properly, both of these teams have to be in perfect sync. Now this is cool. Nature is incredibly organized. It's not just a random jumble of things thrown together. Nope. It's built up in levels, almost like a video game, where you go from level one all the way to the final boss level. Let's see how it works, starting with just one single player. Okay, level one. It all starts with an individual, just one single organism. In our case, look at this cute little rabbit. All alone, just one. This is our starting point. But of course, one rabbit usually doesn't stay alone for long, right? When a group of the same kind of individuals, like all these rabbits, live together in the same area, we call it a population. So a population is just a team of the very same players. Okay, so what happens when you have different populations living together? Let's say you have the rabbit population, the deer population, and the fox population, all sharing the same space. This is what we call a community. It's just like your neighborhood, where you have many different families living together on the same street. And now for the final boss level. When you take the entire community, all the living things, and you add in all the abiotic, non-living things they use, like the river, the sunlight, the soil, bam, you get an ecosystem. This is the whole thing, the complete picture, the entire world they all live in. Okay, pause. Quick break for a very, very important exam question. What is the difference between a population and a community? Now listen, it's simple. Population is a group of only one species, like a group of rabbits. A community is a group of many different species or populations living together, like rabbits and deer and foxes. Got it? Perfect. So, all these animals and plants in an ecosystem are constantly interacting, and the most important interaction the one that gives everyone the energy to live is, well, it's food. So let's look at this whole thing as a big game of who eats whom. So let's see how this energy actually moves. It all starts with a producer. 
in this case, grass, which makes its own food using sunlight. Then along comes the primary consumer, a plant eater like this grasshopper, which gets energy by eating the grass. Next up, a secondary consumer, like this frog, eats the grasshopper. And finally, a tertiary consumer, like the snake, comes and eats the frog. Do you see that? This step-by-step -step flow of energy from one to the next is called a food chain. But in the real world, nature is not that simple, is it? A snake might eat a frog, but it might also eat a mouse. And an owl might also want to eat that same mouse. It gets very complicated. When you connect all the different food chains in an ecosystem, you get what we call a food web. And doesn't it look a bit like a plate of Maggie noodles, all tangled and interconnected? This just shows that everyone really depends on everyone else for survival. So, the most crucial point here is that this food web is perfectly balanced. But what do you think would happen if we just removed one single player from this big, messy game? Let's find out with a real story from right here in India. I want you to meet the Indian bullfrog. He looks pretty harmless, doesn't he? But some years ago, a decision involving this very frog created a huge, huge problem for farmers all across our country. Let me tell you the story. So here's what happened. Back in the 1980s, India used to export a lot of frog legs to other countries. Because of this, the number of frogs went down and down and down. Now, what do frogs love to eat? That's right, insects. With fewer frogs to eat them, the population of insects and pests just exploded. It was a total disaster for our farmers whose crops were getting destroyed. They had to spend lakhs and lakhs of rupees on extra pesticides. Finally, the government realized its mistake and banned the export of frog legs. This story is a perfect example of how removing just one link can break the entire chain. And here's another very important exam question for you. We've talked about producers and consumers, but what about decomposers? You know, like fungi and bacteria? Why are they called nature's recyclers? Well, the answer is simple. They break down all the dead plants and animals and return all those useful nutrients right back into the soil. Because of them, nothing is ever wasted in nature. They are the ultimate cleanup crew. Okay, Bacho, let's bring everything together now. We've learned about habitats, ecosystems, food webs, and the importance of balance. So what does this all mean for us? And more importantly, what are the key points for your exam? All right, get ready. Here it is, your final revision slide. You can even take a mental screenshot of this. Remember these points. First, everything in an ecosystem is connected. Second, energy flows in a straight line called a food chain. Third, when many food chains get tangled up, they form a food web. Fourth, if you remove even one small part, the entire balance can be broken. And finally, the most important point of all, we humans depend completely on these healthy ecosystems for our own survival, for the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. And listen, this isn't just something from a textbook. Look at this picture of the Sunderbonds, the largest mangrove forest in the entire world, right here in our country. It's such a precious ecosystem. It protects us from storms and gives a home to so much wildlife, including the Royal Bengal Tiger. But it's under threat from human activities like pollution and cutting down trees. This is a real life example of a beautiful ecosystem in danger, and it shows why this balance is so, so important. So we'll end with this final thought. We have seen that from a tiny insect to a giant elephant, every single living thing has an important role to play. So my question to you, my dear students, is this. What is your role? How can you help protect this beautiful, delicate balance of nature? Just think about it. And with that, we finish this chapter. I wish you all the very, very best for your exams. Go and rock it. I know you will all do wonderfully.